Hello! Today's stories come from r slash pro revenge. We've got three stories today. First up, cancel a land lease and hope to make a windfall? Hope you like a lot of dirt. Let me preface this by noting that this revenge was not my doing. At least, not exactly. It happened back in the 90s when I was in high school and centered around the type of school I attended. So, in case you weren't aware, it's very common in agricultural communities to have what are known as farmer schools. That's not a technical term, but more just something easy to define them. The schools are generally organized by the local farmers, and while you still study the various courses needed to get into college, you also study farming technology courses and get credit hours for work study, i.e. working on one or more farms. The area I lived in was surrounded by a number of large farms which grew cotton primarily. So during the year, we'd spend time out in the field both tilling, planting, and harvesting. One of the farms near the school was this thousand-acre spread that, like the others, grew mostly cotton, though sometimes they rotated to soybeans or silage. Basically corn, but you don't harvest it. This farm had a long partnership with the school, so the students provided near-free labor for the farmer. The farmer leased this property from some out-of-state owner and paid them a portion of the revenue from the harvest. Imagine my surprise then when I and many of my classmates arrived at the farm to do our work study and the farmer instructed some to crew the sprayers and start spraying herbicide on the fields, while others, myself included, were to take tractors and discs and plow everything under. The farmer wanted every square inch in the fields returned to just dirt. We were shocked, to say the least. But after some discussion, we set to work. It took us the better part of a weekend to do so, and when we were done, the field was in a beautiful, if barren, state. The farmer thanked each of us personally and paid us about $500 each, quite the sum for a 90s high school senior. We returned to the school, told our headmaster that the contract was completed, and he informed us that the farmer would no longer be working with the school, and we'd be sent to one of the other larger farms for the rest of the year and our work study. It was probably two or three months later before word started going around about why we'd been instructed to destroy the crop. Granted, these were just rumors, but based on how things turned out for the farmer, I suspect there's some truth to it. So, apparently the landowner had decided that he was going to not renew the lease the farmer had on the land. This lease renewal just so happened to fall a few weeks before harvest season would start. Given that the average cotton farm earns about $1,500 per acre, a 1,000-acre farm would easily net the owner $1.5 million, about 500 k of that being pure profit. I don't know what the farmer's lease was, but it stands to reason that it wasn't anywhere near that. So this landowner had figured out a neat little trick. Let the farmer get a good crop planted and then refuse to renew the lease. The farmer would leave the plants in the field and the landowner would just need to pay some contractors to come harvest it and they'd earn a profit. Since at the time the farmer's lease wasn't yet up, he decided to prevent that from happening. His act of revenge against the owner was to prevent them from cashing in on their hard work. Sure, it destroyed his farm, and he had to sell off most everything he owned to buy some property for himself, but he'd proved a point. The owner did try to sue the farmer, though he, the owner, really didn't have a leg to stand on, or so I was told. I think the court ruled that since the farmer was still under the lease when he had the land tilled under, and it was his property to do with as he wished, and thus the landowner couldn't tell him what to do with his property. I learned a rather valuable lesson from that man, beyond what I learned about farming. That lesson was, never, ever cross someone with nothing to lose. Edit. Since it was brought up in the comments, let me add some details here. Cotton is one of the few crops which leave a negative nutrient value in the soil meaning that after harvest, even if you till the dead plants under or even if you till them prior to harvest, you won't have as much nutrients as you started with. That's why farmers will plant another crop, usually winter wheat, in place and then till it under rather than harvesting it. This is something commonly called a green manure, but it works to put nutrients that the cotton pulled out of the soil back into it. While the ground wouldn't have been completely dead or sterile, any crop planted on that tract of land without further treatment of the soil wouldn't have produced the same acre per acre yield that a comparable crop would have had he gone to harvest and planted the secondary crop. Which means that the landowner would either have to plant the green manure and spend money that way, or pay by the ton to use artificial fertilizer. Well, 
I'll be honest, I started this channel on a farming theme, even though I know next to nothing about it. I just really enjoy the imagery, machinery, and honesty of the work. Plus, the animals are cute. What I do know, though, is that most farmers aren't going to bother waiting years to sort this out when they can take matters into their own hands to right wrongs to their own satisfaction. I'm obviously generalizing, but I don't think I'm wrong for the majority. Happy to hear if anyone disagrees, though. Let's read a few comments before moving on. Mildly Amused Human started a string of amazing quips with, Reap what you sow. There's no cash left with no till. This has been very informative. And finally, it would have been a lot with combine interest. <laughs> Blaine Moore said, Told this story to my former lawyer wife over dinner. She doesn't know where this was or have any background in farmer law, but says based on how many laws are farmer-inspired as one of the most protected classes print to how our nation formed, the farmer probably got great revenge on the landowner, but lost out on a nice payday he'd have gotten by suing the guy after the fact for not letting him harvest it. In response, the great Baba said, yeah, but I'd rather do as farmer than have to deal with years of legal fees, collection coordination, and other hassles along the way. Something about landowners' audacity and follow-up lawsuit tells me they would have made collecting a nightmare. And finally, Talrog Smash said, Scorched Earth policy gets the point across immediately and removes the possibility of a jury that doesn't understand what is going on. Next up, using my parking space? All good, you will be using it forever. So, I'm living in Japan now, and here people ride bicycles a lot. You can't leave your bike anywhere and you have to pay for parking, between $1 and $2 per day. There are very few free parking areas for bicycles. Most people leave their bikes at the same place so they pay monthly because it's cheaper and you have your own space. This started a couple of weeks ago. Someone in my building started having a guest who decided to steal my bicycle parking space whenever they came to visit. Sometimes they stayed the whole night so I had to go to the station, pay $1 and come all the way home walking which meant I would need to walk to the station the next day, getting up earlier, walk like 20 minutes to the station while carrying my heavy bag. All the bicycle spaces have a number, which means they are reserved for someone. Mine is the 105, but this fracker decided to take mine whenever they came to visit. The second time this happened, I told the building manager, but they didn't do anything. The third time I saw the bicycle there, it was the same red expensive bicycle. I left a note in Japanese saying, Please don't leave your bicycle here. This is my space and I am using every day. I found the note taped with the tape I used to tape it on their bike to my parking space and it had a couple of bad words in Japanese at the end. Basically, he was not only stealing my space, but making fun of me by insulting me. Fine. It's just fine. I probably wouldn't have done anything about it if he hadn't written those words. This triggered me and got the worst in me. This person did it again a couple of times, so I knew this would continue. I was thinking about buying another bicycle, a better, more expensive one I could use to go on cycling trips, so a good chain lock was needed anyway. I bought one of the thickest they had at the store and decided to try its efficiency. I locked his bicycle next time I saw it there. It hasn't moved for the last seven days. There were two notes. The first one was a very aggressive one, with more bad words and threats about going to the police, which I don't care. Let's go that way, buddy. Second note, days later, was an apology, and they begged for me to unlock the bike because they tried to break it, but they couldn't. I guess he has learned his lesson. I'm pretty sure he won't do it again, but I just want to enjoy this feeling of victory a couple of days more. I will free it in two to three days, I guess. Edit. Thank you very much for the awards, the support, and all the comments. You guys are amazing. In order to keep my name out of any legal issues, I changed parking lots. It is not as close as this one, but I could come back in a month or two, and I would be getting a new space, so it would be okay. I left a tiny and very discreet note saying I will free his bicycle in exchange of $100. I wanted to ask for more, but probably he wouldn't pay it. I wrote, tape the bill under the seat. I will wait a couple of weeks. If he doesn't pay, I will take it out at night, as far as possible from the place, steal his seat, cut the brakes and tires and all the other small pieces I can get or destroy. I can't steal the bike and dump her somewhere else because he locked it so I would need to carry it. The lock I got is the thickest and one of the most expensive in the bicycle shop. You can't cut it with normal tools because the thing is as thick as my finger. I'm pretty sure you need some kind of industrial tools to cut it. 
it would be easier to cut the parking device because the metal is thinner there. <laughs> I wonder if OP will get any money in the end or be the bigger person and free the bike. But I think destroying the bike is a bit much. Just my opinion. I guess it depends how many of those 20 minute each way extra walks you had to do. The comments also had some more suggestions and wisdom. Kino Queen said, Tell him he also needs to pay your parking fee for the month before you'll unlock it. He was using up your space, so he should also pay for it. OP. Ooh, that's good. Didn't think about that. Ladude One commented, I'd say frack him. Cancel your monthly payment and rent another spot. Let the parking owner deal with it. Because if you unlock him, he'll now know you were the guy and may decide to do dumber things like breaking your bike after. Slayer991 agreed. I was thinking the same thing. New bike, new spot, and leave the butthole's bike locked in the spot after canceling. Read my bio for Cartoon said, There is a 500% chance he is going to lock your bike in retaliation as soon as you let his bike go. And now for our main event. Do not want me to work my notice? Okay, I will not work during my notice. I had originally posted this in r slash malicious compliance where someone suggested I post this in one of the heavier revenge subs. This happened almost five years ago. Some details are intentionally vague. This will be a long read, but I promise it will be worth it at the end. I was working in an organization that was super toxic. So much so that we were a revolving door. Most employees stayed only a few months. To counter this, our management put three months notice into everyone's contract, including existing employees. It's not strictly illegal where this happened, but very unusual. I believe the idea was to make it harder for employees to find a job outside as employers didn't usually want to wait for three months. However, this didn't work as people simply quit and waited for a month or two before starting their job hunt. I was there almost four years. I needed the money, so I put up with whatever abusive stuff was thrown at me. My boss was a guy we'll call Vince, not actual name. Now, Vince was not particularly good, but he sometimes respected the fact that I was the most tenured grunt in the organization. Do you note that after about two years, I was doing a lot of additional work in addition to my official responsibilities, primarily because I was the only one who knew how to do those. Everyone else had already left. This will become important later. Enter Rajesh, not actual name. Rajesh was poached from a somewhat infamous company and was literally flown in from a different continent. He was brought in for strategically improving our division. This was quite strange given our division generated most profits. Within months, Rajesh made the environment even more toxic. He pulled Vince's team under him and got Vince fired, and he actively encouraged us grunts to spy on each other. Rajesh also had it out for me from day one. Till date, I don't know why. He started making my life more harder than the others. This culminated in him taking me aside and telling me that I was not pulling my weight. Now, at this point, I was doing quite well in the organization. Plus, I had been doing a lot of additional work, critical to our business, since only I knew certain systems and processes. See high attrition above. So I was quite angry. I started looking out. I still wasn't brave enough to quit and start looking. Fortunately, I was able to find a job that was willing to wait the three months. So it was my turn to take Rajesh aside and tell him I quit. Boy, Rajesh was miffed. He went from denial, you can't quit, to negotiation. What if I give you a raise at the year end? To acceptance. Thus, I was serving my notice and working away like an honest bee, my usual work, plus the additional work. At this point, I was called by HR and told that Rajesh wanted me gone. The insane part was that they wanted me to pay the company for the two and a half months shortfall in notice. I obviously refused, then went back and checked the contract. Turns out, a notice of less than three months could only happen through mutual consent and the initiating party, company if they wanted me gone sooner, or me if I wanted to leave earlier, had to compensate the other party for the shortfall. The next day, I stopped doing almost all of my work. I logged in and logged out my hours and did squat. I stopped doing any additional work I've been doing and started taking it really, really slow on my primary job responsibilities. Since no one else understood the details of what I did, I knew it would be really hard for Rajesh or HR to prove I was doing any of this on purpose. Then I sat back with my popcorn. Soon, there was a complete meltdown all around. Rajesh would pull me into meetings and scream and try to bully me, and I would say nothing but smirk to his face. 
Then they tried to have someone else learn the additional work I used to do for me so that they could do what I did. Remember I said earlier how I was the only one who knew some of the old systems and processes? Well, now I claimed I didn't really remember any of them. So obviously there could be no handover. Rajesh could do nothing as none of this had been my responsibility or part of my contract since the leadership had been only too happy to see me do this for free. Soon, my workplace turned into a dumpster fire. The HR and Rajesh smartened up and offered to buy out my notice if I cooperated and helped transition my work. I refused. Then, to twist the knife further, I started having meetings with fellow grunts. Remember, everyone was always a newbie. And encouraging them to leave as well. Indirectly, nothing that could implicate me. HR tried to get me to leave twice more, but I ended up serving the full three months. Remember the mutual consent part? Three months? I just don't understand. It sounds like OP went above and beyond his role and put up with way too much foolishness already. The employer had a figurative golden goose who was willing to suffer through that workplace and still couldn't help but chastise him? OP had a few replies in the comments before we wrap up. Turtle Sandwich said, It is like the company forgot that it was made up of people. When the people are gone, so is the company. Brilliant Air 76 asked, What happened when you left? Did he get fired? OP. No, Rajesh eventually ran the division to the ground and got everyone laid off. He then left for greener pastures. Last I heard, he was doing very well for himself. I Armin said, What a gold mine. A place I can do almost nothing and they can't fire me for three months? I can't figure out how that didn't blow up in their faces from day one. OP. Because people are normally decent and want to do the right thing, even when their jobs or bosses are being super nasty with them. To be honest, I was on track to do the same until they tried to kick me out and make me pay for it. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.